Hi, uh, I'm Alan. Uh, this is the talk about uh, the rise of Elastic IPFS. So um, as you've just kind of learned, I guess, a little bit, uh, Elastic IPFS is a new, it's open source IPFS implementation that runs in the cloud. Uh, it separates read and write pipelines to allow it to scale massively. Um, if you're interested in the uh, Elastic IPFS architecture and you're watching this on a video in the future, then you should look at Francisco's talk that he just gave. Um, and also, um, like I said, there's a, there's a deep dive into the provider subsystem later today in the content routing performance track uh, with me and Paolo. Uh, this talk, though, this talk is the story of how we got our initial implementation uh, out of the door and into production. Uh, so let's let's go. Let's first talk a little bit about what this all kind of hinges on. So what we have is this tool, uh, which is continuously collecting data um, on the uploads that both NFT.storage and Web3.storage receive. And um, and so the gist of of this thing is we we pick a CID. Uh, that we know we're storing and we pick a peer that we know that's storing that data um, and uh, we do some stuff to check up on that information um, and then we graph it on this nice uh, on this nice Grafana panel um, and so these are like the, the headline stats um, uh, but you can see like uh, up the top left there there's DHT provider records so this is the percentage of time where um, we ask the DHT if there is a provider record that says that this CID is being provided by this peer and that's um, you can see like we at this period of time not doing so well uh, like about 50 percent kind of uh, availability um, top uh, top right here is bit swap availability so what we do is we make a lib p2p connection to the peer that we know is meant to be storing that CID uh, and we ask it using a bit swap have message do you have this CID of <laughs> and so it's meant to say yes uh, doesn't always happen um, that's bad um, uh, but anyway, that's that. That's that panel. We also uh, chart like checks per second, but uh, connection errors. So what can happen is when we're trying to connect to that peer, we might experience a connection error um, because it is uh, very busy, or it's broken, or uh, down, and that's no good. And that's uh, often the reason why this is not 100%. Um, connection error is also bad <laughs> at this period of time, um, and. Um, and so this bottom right panel is bit swap round trip time. So the, the actual time it takes to send that have message and receive a response uh, response to it. So um, they're the kind of headline stats. You can get a real overview of like, this is all of the nodes, that all of the peers that we're running um, in, uh, in, in all of our clusters that we have. Um, for NFT storage. Um, and then from there, you can, can drill down into uh, per peer metrics. And so this is rainbow mode. And uh, rainbow mode is not meant to be a thing that indicates that our peers are acting very erratically. Um, and that is not a good thing that you want from your uh, production infrastructure. Uh, so um, this becomes more useful when you actually filter by a particular peer. Um, I've just selected like random ones here. This isn't the same peer, these are random ones. Like this top left one was having a really bad time on connections and maybe it got restarted and then you can see it's um it's doing uh, a, a lot better um this one is uh this guy was um it, we were finding provider records for this particular peer for every cid that we checked for well not every cid but most of them and then it started to have a bit of a bad time um bits what found this was one was doing okay had a really bad time and then maybe got restarted again and you get you kind of get the idea um this is like drilling, drilling down into purpose. So I mean, we, you can see uh, from here, this is a really good indication of when there's a peer that's, um, that's currently in trouble, uh, is struggling in some, in some way because the checks are telling us that uh, think bad things are going on. Um, anyway, you get the idea um, that like all of these, all of those metrics that you see in that Grafana are all like specific to the data that we're storing. So they're CIDs that we know have been uploaded, uploaded to web3.storage and nft.storage. Um, so they're specific to us, but um, this like this all hinges on this um, IPFS check tool, um, which is like a generic public open source API that is available to for anyone to use. So and anyone can run it themselves. We actually run our own one as well. Um, uh, and so you can just go and put your CID in and your peer and check if uh, if good things are happening, and it will show you the results. Um, uh, afterwards, it's made by the dean because he's a wizard, and uh, we lean on, lean on it really heavily for those um, those stats. So thank you. Um, Rad. Okay. So um, anyway, how to production. Um, so CheckUp gave us the tools to uh, kind of determine um, how Elastic IBFS was performing, basically. Um, 
uh, as you learned in the previous kind of talk, Elastic IPFS works off of um, S3 buckets. It, uh, car files that people upload go straight into S3 buckets, and it reads the blocks out of those, uh, directly out of those car files. Um, what we in in our in dot storage inf um, kind of uh, APIs at the moment, like we already write to S3 buckets, and we were doing we've been doing that forever for like disaster recovery, uh, just in case our cluster decides to blow up. Like we still got like some uh, some kind of extra backup of all of the data uh, that we could restore restore from um, if anything happened. Um, but that turned out to be really good because it meant that we could get Elastic IPFS up and running, ingest all the, our existing data and any new data that was coming in without putting Elastic IPFS on the critical path for either of those products. Uh, so yeah, that, that would turn out to be really good. Anyway, so these are the, these are the things that happened uh, and the graphs that show the uh, resolution things. Um, but like, first of all, when the implementation was done, when, pa when Paolo and the team finished uh, like building it, we, like, we did this kind of sanity step zero, uh, like, is this thing a goer check? Um, and, um, and so this is kind of like a, a really noddy, like one-to-one uh, -one connection, send, like try and transfer something over bits. So it's not really typical of IPFS because potentially you'll be able to get stuff over bits from multiple peers. Um, but this is just, um, Kind of, is it is it actually going to be usable? And so, just to note, like we do expect IPF, uh, Elastic IPFS to be a little bit slower than Go IPFS because we're trading off. We've got network I/O where we're fetching stuff from S3 buckets uh, and and the indexes from the DynamoDB versus like disk I/O, which is like SSD disk. You can create that really really fast. Um, so anyway, this is a speed test. Before we did like any optimizations, it was just fresh out the door, um, and and like we found that it was you know it was it was reasonable, it was usable, and uh, so we're like, okay, right, let's, uh, let's continue. Um, and so there's, there's optimizations that we've done and are still to come that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so after that, the, the kind of first thing we, we managed to do was, um, was optimize our bit swap round trip time. We noticed that it was uh, all the way up here around like six milliseconds, which is a little bit slower um, than, um, than uh, regular kind of Go IPFS, Kubo IPFS. Um, uh, and so we managed to actually kind of almost half that um, uh, round trip time, and it's it's now it's a lit, tiny bit slower than um, than Go IPFS on a on a good day, but still like consistently better than um, a lot of our cluster peers um, in in our in our clusters at the moment. So, what did we do to optimize it? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. Paolo, do you know what we did to optimize it? Uh, you mean the before peer, right? How did that happen? Uh, we use HTTP uh, pipeline testing network. Okay. Because when we fetch from S3, we treat S3 like uh, basically a HTTP source. And by leverage, leveraging Ubish with the HTTP pipeline, the concurrency spiked rather than using PMAP or Sydney. That was the main trick. Oh, okay. That's oh, it. We'll get another really big box in then. Um, with the, the path ranges. Yeah. Um. That's the only one I actually don't know what happened. <laughs> um, so thanks. Um, <laughs> right. uh, anyway, so the next thing that happened to us was that the indexer nodes came online, uh, and and this is this was amazing to watch because I was I was like um, camping in a field at the time and I was just sat on my mobile, I was like on Grafana, just right refreshing it. Um, but but the, within a few few, few days, uh, they read all of the advertisements that we generated and have, and effectively they would indexed the majority of all data ever uploaded to web3.storage, nft.storage, that's terabytes of data. That's 1.5 billion, more than that, CIDs um, in total. Uh, and, and once it got up there, it's basically stayed on like here for ever, ever, ever since, which is incredible. And um, like, I, I don't know if maybe we can go back to, when you look at um, rainbow mode, this is the same uh, so, so, sort of thing that was happening. Um, yeah, this is the same graph, um, but like it's just everywhere. Um, it's it's like that sort of thing. Whereas we're we're now like consistently up in the you know nineties to hundreds. Um, also, this ingest we could do way faster now that we have the batch that sits in Dynamo because we could get the return of the lambdas and then we could do like ten thousand lambdas return. So yeah, this wouldn't even take two days now; it would take like eighty hours. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, um, so anyway, the, the, the 
cool thing about this is that um, once the indexer nodes had indexed all of this data, um, it, it meant that like these provider records were like um, essentially available on the DHT. So, um, so people started discovering Elastic IPFS. Um, and, uh, and that put it under load, which is rad. Uh, but then we saw connection errors. We started seeing this in the graphs and we were like, oh no, what's happened? Um, and so we managed to, we ma this is where we fixed that. Um, but we, uh, we <laughs> in node, there's this massive foot gun. If you've got an event emitter and you emit an event called error uh, and don't listen for that event, then it just takes down the whole process. And turns out we'd missed that in one of the connections uh, that we were making. Uh, and that was what was causing that. So um, this is where we fixed it. Um, I only started seeing it when we started getting loads of traffic. Um, and then um, after that, that was fixed. We still had, we still, there's still some connection errors there, but we'll talk about that, about that in a second. Um, the thing we, we did realize was uh, that we weren't currently graphing in checkup was the um, time between a user uploading a car file and the time it takes for that data to be available on the IPFS network. And by that, I mean um, people can connect to the I, an IPFS peer and transfer it via BitSwap. That's important to us because as soon as people can transfer it via BitSwap, it's available on the gateways, essentially. And a lot of our uh, read traffic is through gateways. So we, this is an important metric for us to, us to be tracking. Um, uh, and so we did some changes and now we can graph this. Uh, but like this is currently at, like it, it, the actual time to index a car varies based on um, like the size of a car, uh, but also the number of um, blocks, uh, the number of blocks and the block size as well um, can change. So it like it's diff different. This this is old. This is the old <laughs> value. We did some um, changes recently to the DynamoDB, DB, which we already talked about, where we now bulk um, bulk write, which basically I think half this or, or something like that. Um, so essentially, you know, this is this means that data that gets uploaded or car files that get uploaded um, are available on the gateways in you know less than a second ish. Uh, uh, depend like given depending on what what size and number of blocks are in a car file. Like you can have a, have a really small car file that's thirty meg, but it can also have like ten thousand blocks in it because because in NFTs are the, they do these ten k drops uh, and they have like assets that so they have ten k like images which are big, but they also have metadata for each one and each one of these is like a tiny JSON file. So you have like ten k blocks of J, uh, JSON files. So. You can have a small car file, relatively small car file with loads of blocks in it that needs to be indexed. And previously we were writing for every single block to the DynamoDB. Now we just write them all at once. Um, if you want to test for this, there are, block, there are car files of Bitcoin block data and every gigabyte car file has like 10 million blocks in it. So if you want to test for this, for <laughs> Cool. Um, so yeah, network availability, we did that. Uh, then um, this was the other, the second, uh, second kind of. Connect. We realized that there were still kind of connection errors. It was causing these little, um, little bumps in our bit swap no response. So things were trying to connect and not, not responding. Um, and uh, for this, we found the reason was that we, we actually depend on a native dependency called Sodium Native. It's used, used by Noise to do the connection encryption. Um, and uh, what was happening was that under load that native dependency was somehow triggering this like race condition in node 16 um and uh and like just pulling the whole process down so the whole the, like the whole kubernetes container had had to be restarted essentially uh which is not good when you need a like a bit swap connection that is kind of open for a long period of time to send stuff um so this is where we fixed that and um Turns out this is like the first time it's ever happened to me, but the internet said that um, in node 17, it had been fixed. Uh, so we, <laughs> we took a punt on that and upgraded to node 18, because that's the next long-term support version um, in, in our bit swap peers, and it fixed it. And ah, can't believe it worked. <laughs> can't believe it worked, but it did. And I was so happy. Uh, that's me happy. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, so then, then like we didn't see that error ever again, so which is bad. Um, and so that at this point, we were feeling pretty confident in Elastic IPFS. Um, we had consistently good metrics on the checkups for, for kind of uh, a few weeks, and we decided to do like a soft deploy. 
Um, in, in Cloudflare workers, what you can do is you can, um, you can essentially keep the worker alive and running um, without blocking on sending a response to the user. So previously what we were doing is we were uploading cars to cluster. We were also uploading to them to S3 at the same time, waiting for both of, the, both of those tasks to finish and then responding, um, responding to, the, to the user. Uh, and so we switched that round so that we uploaded to S3, we responded to the user, and in the background, we still upload to cluster, so it's also, uh, also in cluster. Um, and uh, this happened. <laughs> uh, we, we saw a massive reduction in the amount of time it takes to upload stuff, a huge reduction in variance as well, uh, which, is, which is incredible. And, uh, and everyone was very happy and um, got excited. Uh, and um, yeah, it meant that there was just a whole lot, a whole lot less fire to, to kind of deal with. Uh, and um, we had a very good time. Um, and so like the only thing left to do now is to take cluster out of the picture completely for uploads. We still use it for um, pinning service APIs. So people are still gonna pin CIDs to us and we need cluster to actually go and fetch stuff from the network. Um, so cluster can basically do what it does best. Like it, it, it is for pinning things and that's what it does. Uh, pinning data, finding and fetching data from the IPFS network and storing it. Um, and so uploads, actual uh, car file uploads can, um, can, can go straight, in, straight into S3, be indexed by Elastic IPFS and be available um, uh, like that. Um, and so as we need to just do the hard deploy and, and then also the optimization. So these are some of the optimizations that we've done and are thinking of. We've already done the, uh, we added an LRU cache to the, um, to the bit swap peers. So any blocks that it's seen very recently will just be able to serve without going to the DynamoDB for the index information or going to S3 to get the block from the um, a car file. Um, we need to take advantage of data proximity. The way, um, <laughs> the, like I said, we always put stuff like in the backup bucket. And I think midway through this, the Elastic IBFS being, um, being built, we decided that uh, we'd just use that bucket rather than have a separate bucket that we upload to. And, um, and so Elastic IBFS stuff is all deployed in the, uh, in the west and the buckets in the east. So whenever the peers need to serve data, you need to get it from the other side of America. And so, um, yeah, so that, you know, that, that, that's time, but it's also money for us. <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, we, we'll fix that pretty soon. Um, we can also have multi-region peers. Currently, all of our bits what peers are in the same region. Um, so we could put them in multiple, multiple region, regions and also have people connect to them uh, in, in a place that's closer to them than um, the other side of the world, uh, which would be rad. Um, uh, yeah. Um, by by range versus request optimizations. Um, yeah, so if, if we're asking for multiple CIDs within a car file um, and, and they're in the same one, rather than making separate requests for each block, what we could do is make one request that covers that whole range and maybe we get some junk in the middle, but that might be faster than making separate requests for each block. Um, and then also take advantage of um, data locality. So um, if you've uploaded a car file with a DAG in it and then someone starts to bit swap that, it's likely they're gonna want the other blocks in that same car file. Like we get this magic kind of, um, it, it's the same DAG. So you're probably gonna want, and what we could do is just, instead of like serving each individual block, we could just um, like preload that whole car into the cache so that like as the bit swap, um, session progresses as they ask for the route and then ask for more and stuff. We've already got that stuff to serve to them um, straight away. Um, this one I haven't told anyone about, but I thought that what we could do is, uh, I think I think we currently issue like a, a like to, to the DynamoDB, like what's the index for this CID um, and then get the data back. But I think we can ask it for multiple CIDs at once and get all of that data back. So we might be able to do something there. Um, and uh, also, yeah, we'd love to maybe switch to R2 or use R2 from Cloudflare um, because of the, the free egress, um, because that's free uh, costs money for egress. And, uh, and that's all of the optimizations, and that's the finish of my talk. You've missed it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? You go. Uh, so, those graphs that you showed uh, still don't have the second point fixed, right? The proximity? The proximity? No. 
No, the only thing we've done is the LAU cache. People will get faster. Yeah, everything's yeah. everything's gonna get. Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? I have one question about the batch uh, of updates that you guys did. Um, yeah. So when you're scanning a car file, you're not skipping blocks anymore. Just uh, batch inserting every block and writing on top. Is that right? Yeah, yeah I think it's just an override. Override the, the existing blocks because we know that if, if a block like. The key is the block and the, the, the car, the path of the car file. So it, it's going to be like the same offset, the same length. So you can just trust that and, and override it. Yeah. Yeah. And when, when you do the read, you, you basically have to do like a limit one range query in order to just get the first one for that particular multi path. Um, but one of the cool things that like we've talked about is we should just generate car V2 indexes for everything ever. And then once we see that like, you know, a bunch of CIDs are in a couple different car files, you should just grab those car indexes, and I bet they're all in one, actually, and then you just do one big range. And like, yeah, cool. Is the, um, the check monitoring tool that you used for evaluating when you were ready to switch to Elastic Provider, I know that it's using IPFS check into the hood, but the, um, but the packaging that into a, hey, I want to monitor this set of CIDs, like, for, you know, for yeah. as an infrastructure it's, operator, is that something that's, like, open source that other people can use? It, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's called Checkup. It's in a GitHub repo in the web3.storage org. Uh, and yeah, you just set environment variables like the cluster API URL that you want to use. And um, we've changed it, obviously, to also include Elastic Provider. Um, but yeah, like anyone, like it's not specific to our, it's specific to our setup in that we have cluster and Elastic Provider. But other than that, um, uh, anyone can use it. It's open source and available.